come to the end of yourself? Or do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no Jesus is calling to bring sorrows to trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are
God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Oh
children's church this morning so you kids are dismissed I know that the, the workers down there are anxiously waiting to see you again well if you have your Bibles and I hope you do turn to John chapter 4 this morning John chapter 4, we're going to be in verse 20, and this, these are just awkward Sundays, of course. We're social distancing. Um, Kennedy, my youngest, is five. She has no hope of social distancing. That's why her middle name is Hope. So her and mom are still at home. Figured she'd be in about five different laps already this morning if she was here. Uh, but my two boys are, Henry, Ethan, are you guys up there? Six feet, all right, six feet. There's six feet between Henry and Ethan. Yeah, there he is. Ethan just moved and separated himself more from Henry. I, w- I love it, man. I wish I could like take a camera, get back there, way to you know get a camera back there. This is priceless. Um, big thanks to. Uh, just want to mention before I start, thanks to all of our helpers, our volunteers that are coming back this week. Um, Dennis Lane, I think you get the gold medal award for coming in today this morning. Um, but our, our deacons, Harold Bradford has just done an incredible job with our deacon team. And Harold, I know he's probably up walking around doing something right now. Just big thanks to Harold if you see him. Don't give him a big hug, but show him some appreciation. He just, just does a great, great job. And Maddie Boltinghouse, saw Casey and Maddie in the back. Uh, she gave us a couple of our children's videos during quarantine. So thanks for doing that from the family room of your house. Our kids engaged in those projects, and, and it was just a lot of fun. Um, there's so many people... And it's, and it's great to see everybody kind of coming together during this time and continuing to worship and to be the church. Uh, a lot of times when we go through situations like these, we really end up coming closer together through it. And I've certainly experienced that with our church community here. Uh, the generosity of our church family continues through giving. It's just been a, a really great time. And, and during this time, we really do... Um, we, we sense the things that are really important. You know, the, the unimportant things in life tend to go towards the, the peripheral and the central things. And, and one of those central things with any church is just this whole idea of biblical community. Uh, TBC has a, a strong, strong biblical community, and, there, and there's friendships. And so, Kathy, I just want to say, like, hang on for a couple more weeks before we hug everybody, okay? But we love seeing you, and we love seeing your family here. And it's, and it's, a, great, um, it's a great thing to be a part of a church community and to see faces again and, and to worship together again. So thank you so much for being here. Now that you've sat down and everybody's spread out, which I, what I want you to do is stand back up, and we are going to read John chapter 4, beginning in verse 20 is where I'll start. So please stand out of honor and respect for God's word, and we'll dive in. John chapter 4, verse 20. It says, Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes... He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Father, we just, um, we thank you so much for our church family. 
We thank you for the time that we've been able to be the church to one another, uh, to other believers, and to those who around, around us who desperately need the love of Christ and the truth of the gospel. Lord, I pray that with these uh, short moments that we have together this morning as we look into your word, that you would change us deeply at the core of who we are, that you would impact all of our hearts. Give us eyes to see the truth from your text, ears to listen to it, a heart to accept it, and the courage to change our life because of it. Lord, we pray that the gospel and the truth of your word would continue to mold us and to shape us into who you've created us to be. We ask these things to you, Father, through the Son and by the Spirit, for you three are the one true God, and there is no God besides you. Amen. You guys may be seated. Tulsa Bible Church has been extremely blessed to have this facility, but if we were meeting in any other time in church history, it goes without saying that this building would probably look a lot different. It would probably be much different than the building that we are sitting in today. From the very beginning of the church, a critical aspect of Christianity has been the gathering of the community together for what we call corporate worship or body worship in the church. And the New Testament says that the very first churches that met together actually met in people's homes. This was a, a big transition from synagogue worship or from temple worship that was carried over from the Old Testament. Acts 2.46 talks about the apostles meeting in people's homes, breaking bread from home to home. Romans 16 talks about a, a home church that met in Priscilla and Aquila's house. And these are just uh, a couple references to home churches. There's, there's other references throughout the New Testament. Meeting places in, in people's homes left the trappings of the material world and the grandeur to the side, and they opted instead for a, an internal, a spiritual, rather than a physical manifestation of symbolism in the church body. Not too long after that, um, when Constantine legalized Christianity in the Edict of Milan, A.D. 313, houses were too small to accomplish what they were accomplishing in the early church, and so they had to move to what was called Roman basilicas. And so, again, we're just going to take like a little tour through church history and church buildings, all right? The very first formal buildings for churches to gather were called basilicas. And basilicas were known for doing two things. Number one, they reflected the light. Okay, so much like our church today, if you, if you turn around, if you can see this, it's a big stained glass window just in front of me to, the, to your rear at the top of this building. And when the sun rises, that sun will piercingly come in right on stage. And then as, as it sets, as, as the sun rises in the sky, that shadow and that light moves out the door as you see it. It's, it's really amazing thing to see when, you, when the uh, lights are all off in the sanctuary here. This, this sanctuary was built in this location for a very um, distinct purpose, for reason. And one of those reasons is so that the light could reflect on the truth of God's word and on the altar of God as we gather together for worship. The other thing you'll notice about basilicas is the length of them. The aisles, the corridor, everything was leading to the altar of God. And this reflected um, the fact that, number one, God is light. Jesus said that he was the light of the world. But number two, that there's a pathway. All of us are on this path, on this journey and the gospel intersects us at this journey right at the point of the cross when we become believers. The Roman basilicas were very strategic in their structure, reflecting, of course, you can see the, uh, the form of a cross just in their, in their makeup and their design, but also this journey that we're all on. And two things happened in history after basilicas became big that had an enormous impact on church buildings and how they're structured even today. Number one is the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay, so if you guys are memorizing your timelines, Visigoths sacked Rome, right? And the fall of the Roman Empire meant many changes for society and for the world altogether. The other thing that was happening was that Christianity was on the rise. Christianity was spreading rapidly through Western Europe. The megacity of Rome, of course, had been forsaken, had been taken by pagans, and mankind needed to deeply look at themselves and find God by, again, this inward penetration of looking to the core of who they were. 
As such, the basilicas were replaced by the monasteries. And the monasteries were built in far-off places where you could go into the quiet, away from the trappings of the world and in the hustle and bustle of society, and you could find God in the contemplative, the quiet places in life. This is a monastery that is, is built in, in Greece. It's called Mount Athos. Uh, another one here is perhaps one of my favorite monasteries. I'd, I would love to just figure out how people even get to that. Uh, this is called Meteora. Meteora in, in Greek literally means suspended in the air. And so you had a lot of monasteries that were built into, into the side of cliffs and mountains that were very difficult to get to. And here's where the monastics and the mystics gathered together some of the greatest contemplative p- prayers of the saints in church history came from these monasteries that were tucked away in far-off places. And people were, again, they were escaping the world in order to find the truth of God, something that they couldn't find in the, the hustle and bustle of everyday life. They had to retreat to the secluded places of life. Near the end of the 8th century, we had a king named Charles the Great, Charlemagne. And Charles the Great fostered a revival of learning and fine arts. And it, in historical time, it was a cultural rebirth brought on by Char- Charlemagne. And he decreed that every monastery have a school of education specifically for boys as part of it. Charlemagne was the, he was the king of order in society. In fact, the things that Charlemagne did with education and society in general to bring order to it have lasted all the way up into the time of, of Napoleon Bonaparte. Really, the, the things that Charlemagne put in order for society and culture in general went untested and continued into the early 1800s. And entire towns began. Now the monastery was not tucked away in far-off places and hard-to-reach areas. Now the monasteries came to the middle of the town, and the entire town was built around these great cathedrals of education. As scholasticism and, and humanism emerged and education continued to grow at this time, these cathedrals were led to the great time of, of the Renaissance, and they were enormous in size and structure. Gothic cathedrals in themselves were just, still today you can go to, to parts of Europe and, and tour these historic buildings. They're just amazing. And they are uh, specimens of, of what man has created to worship God. The Cathedral of Notre Dame in, in Paris is pictured here. Of course, this is pre-fire. I think it's been rebuilt now after the fire. Uh, here's another cathedral in in Austria, Vienna, St. Charles Cathedral. It's very well known, no expenses spared. The cathedrals were designed to be the place where heaven met earth. Okay, so oftentimes when you look up in the ceiling of a cathedral, you would see just that, the sky, and angels, and reminiscent of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, the things that were depicted by it. And, and, And again, the architecture the detail, the precision of these structures was very, very impressive through church history. American churches, when the America was beginning to be settled and missionaries came here, took on a, a New England house church, is what we would call this. And in fact, if you stick a steeple on top of that structure right there, you've basically got every First and Second Baptist church in America today. It looks almost exactly like that. Uh, the, the house churches of New England had high roofs. They were versatile. They were big meeting rooms, so you could make them into places of education for children and people as they grew up, but also on Sundays there were places of worship for the church. The church was the kingdom of God on earth. And in America, what we really ref- wanted to reflect was that the church building should somehow reflect not only a religious component, but also a political component. This was, the, this was the place where God's kingdom was going to be a part of the settling of American society, culture, and even the government. Today, of course, if you look at our church buildings, if you can dream it, it's out there and you can build it, okay? We've seen some of the greatest megachurches in the last decade, maybe 15 years or so. This is Preston World, Preston Wood, excuse me. 
in Plano, Texas. Um, when I worked at Prestonwood as an intern, we called this Six Flags Over Jesus. 155 acres, right? They had more soccer fields than you could throw a stick at. Baseball stadium, just state of the art to the side of this thing. It is, it is an amazing structure. If you go up to Chicago, you'll find the very famous Willow Creek campus. Again, this is probably about 180 campus site for some of the mega churches of the world. Uh, today, we have churches meeting in, in strip malls and coffee shops and again in people's houses. If, again, if, if you can dream it, if you can think it, it's probably there. None of those hold a candle to Solomon's temple in the Old Testament, right? It's an amazing edifice. I want you to listen to a couple of verses. I've, I've got these on the screen for you. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house I've built, says Solomon, as he prays for the dedication of his temple. Acts 17, verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Now, the reason why Solomon could pray what he prayed in 1 Kings 8 and Paul could write what he wrote in Acts chapter 17 was because an attribute that I want to look at today being that God is spirit. God is spirit. So we're going to continue our sermon series that I've entitled that there is no one like him this morning. In the past, the last few weeks, we've been looking at the attribute that there is only one true God. The first week, we talked about the jealousy of God. Dave Sargent came and, and preached just a really great sermon on God's jealousy. Last week, we looked at God being an eternal God. This week, I want to look at a very well-known passage, John 4, verse 20 through 26, and we're going to talk about God as spirit. And I want to look at three things as we look at this text. Number one, what does it mean? What does it mean that God is spirit? Number two, how does it make sense? And number three, why does it matter? Right. What does it mean that God is spirit? Number two, how does it make sense? And number three, why does it matter? Before we look at those, that outline, I want you to listen to this quote from A.W. Tozer. And he says this. It says, The decline of the knowledge of the holy. Understand, Tozer wrote 50, 60 years ago. And knowledge of God was on a decline then. Now, in our postmodern culture, knowledge of God is even less and less than it was when Tozer wrote. The decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought on our troubles in the church. So he says, a rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way toward curing them. It is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right, while our idea of God is erroneous and inadequate. So Tozer says, if we're going to bring back spiritual power into our lives, and let me just add here, if we're going to bring back spiritual power into our churches in America, we must begin to think of God more nearly as he is. All of us must begin to think of God more nearly as he is. Number one, and number one in your outline this morning. God is spirit. What does that mean? What does it mean that God is spirit? Let's look back at verse 20 after our tour of church buildings through history, right? Verse 20, John 4. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, the Samaritan woman says, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, where they're standing, nor in Jerusalem, on the temple mount, Will you worship the Father? Now, we're picking up this conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman almost right in the middle. And so, like many people today, this Samaritan woman is confused and she is preoccupied with worship. And she is consumed with two things. She is consumed with the place of worship and the people of worship. And so Jesus brings truth and clarity to this situation. But before we look at it, just a little bit of a background on the Samaritans. The Samaritans trace their roots back to the northern kingdom of Israel. The two northern tribes in Israel were Ephraim and Manasseh. 
And in 722, Ephraim and Manasseh were overtaken by the Assyrians. A king by the name of Sennacherib rode in. He took the northern kingdom of Israel for himself. And he, he did this, uh, he thought to himself the same thing that Edward the Longshanks thought in Braveheart. He wanted to get rid of the Jews. And so he said, if we're going to get them out, we should breed them out. And the Samaritans intermixed with the Jews, and they created a new race. It was a half race, a half breed, half Jew and half Samaritan. In Deuteronomy 12, verse 5, it says this. Now, the Samaritans believed in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, but they didn't uh, hold to the prophets or the writings or the Psalms. And so all that the Samaritans were going off of was Genesis through Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 12, verse 5, God commanded Moses this. He said, Seek the place of worship the Lord your God has chosen for you. When the Samaritans read that verse, they went back to Genesis, and they read Genesis 12. One of the first places that Abram built an altar to God was a city known as Shechem. And Shechem was overlooked by the, the highest peak in that area was a mount. It was a mount called Gerizim. In fact, the Mount Gerizim is where this conversation is happening between Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Mount Gerizim is a, a mount of blessing in the Old Testament. Before Moses let, says the, the people, Israelites, were on the border of the Jordan River, and before they cross into the promised land that the Lord God had promised them from the Old Testament, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, they are on Mount Gerizim, and Moses separates the tribes of Israel. He puts half of them on Mount Gerizim, and he puts half of them on Mount Ebal. And he says, these people standing on Mount Gerizim, they stand for the blessings of God. And if you faithfully obey the commands that I'm giving you today, you will enjoy the blessings in the land of promise. The people standing on Mount Ebal stood for the curses of God. And he recounted all of the curses that would overtake the Israelites if they were not faithful to the covenant that the Lord their God was giving to them through Moses. Now the Samaritans looked at that and they said, we want to be part of the blessings of God. And so they identified Mount Gerizim, all those tribes that gathered together on that place. That was significant to them. Mount Gerizim became a sacred space for the Samaritans. And so when the woman references this mountain, verses 21, and Jesus talks about it in verse, the woman in verse 20, and Jesus in verse 21, the mountain they're talking about is Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans held that to be a, a very sacred site, a sacred place for their people to worship. And this is a major contention for the Jewish people, because who was the one that brought the ark back to Jerusalem? David. And he, he erected Jerusalem as the capital city for the Jewish people. It was Solomon who built the temple in Jerusalem, not, not on Mount Gerizim, right? Jesus brings a shock not only to the Samaritan woman, but also to the Jews themselves. And he says in verse 21, An hour is coming, neither on this mountain Gerizim nor in Jerusalem on the temple mount will you worship the Father. Is a principle of the, of the text right away. Unhealthy concern about places will distract us from the person of our worship. If we have an unhealthy concern about the places of worship, it is going to distract us from the person of worship. So what that means is that the facility is not the father, the plant is not the priority. It's the person of worship that should be the priority, not the place of worship. But I want you to see something just as important as the place here. The Samaritan woman was too concerned with the place of worship, Mount Gerizim, but she was also too concerned about people. Because how does she begin in verse 20? Our fathers worshiped here. You guys know the, the famous seven last words of every dying church? We've never done it like that before, right? Our fathers worshiped here. We've never worshiped anywhere else before. She had a, a preoccupation with the place, but she also had a preoccupation with people, and she was caught up in a tradition. And Jesus blows the tradition out of the water. 
The reason why we shouldn't be distracted by the place in our worship is because tradition must not trump freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There is freedom. Freedom from some traditions. When most people read that God is Spirit, immediately the, the thoughts that come into their mind is that God is like a ghost. He's some wispy, ethereal, spiritual being that's out there, but he doesn't take on physical form or physical matter. But to say that God is spirit is a statement of what the Father is like. To say that God is spirit means that he is not limited to a physical body. To say that God is spirit means that he is incomprehensible and he is invisible and he is life-giving. As human beings, this is one thing that separates us. We are finite creatures and we are worshiping the infinite. And there is one thing more than anything, perhaps, that separates us from the reality and from the truth of God. And at any point in any time in our lives, we are confined to a physical place and to our physical being. God is not. God is not localized. God is not containable. Listen to Psalm 139, verse 7. Where can I go to escape from your spirit? The psalmist prays, where can I flee or escape from your presence? If I were to ascend into heaven, you would be there. If I were to sprawl out in Sheol, you would be there. If I were to fly away on the wings of the dawn and and settle down on the other side of the sea, even there your hand would guide me and your right hand would take hold of me. What does it mean that God is spirit? It means that he is uncontainable, he is invisible, he is incomprehensible, and he is not confined to a body or to a physical body space or to physical matter. Number two, how does that make sense? A lot of thoughts are going through your mind probably if if you're tracking with me and if you're listening to these thoughts. For one, Jesus is God, right? And Jesus did take on a physical body. He became physical matter, if we can say that in some sense. In the incarnation, he took on the limitations of a physical human being. Did he? Yes and no. At time, how did the physical body of Jesus walk on water? Remember when the disciples saw him on the Sea of Galilee and, it, and they were afraid because he looked like what? Looked like a ghost. Another really strange and mysterious pat, um, verse of Scripture in, in, with the resurrected Christ. In Luke 24, verse 39, Jesus says, The resurrected Christ. He says, touch me and see. Does a spirit have flesh and bones as you see that I have standing before you today? The resurrected Christ seems to suggest that he's not spirit. He's something different altogether. How do we make sense of all this? Listen to John 1 verse 18. No one has seen the Father at any time except he who is from God, speaking of Jesus. 1 John 4.12 says, No man has ever seen God. Of all, of all people in, in the Scripture, if you could, you know, family feud here, name me one person who has seen the face of God in the Bible. Who would you say? Any takers? You guys would not, I'm not taking any of you on family feud when I go on. Me and Henry and Ethan are going to dominate it. Cummings, who am I talking about? I'm talking about Moses, right? Moses, it says that he looked upon the face of God. He spoke with, with God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And yet, Exodus 33, verse 20, God says to Moses, you cannot see my face because nobody can see me and live. So Mo- God tucks him in the, the cleft of the rock, and, and what does he see? He sees the back of God. Hang on a second. God is spirit. He doesn't have body parts. What did Moses see? We don't, we don't really know what he saw. We know what the text says. The Lord, Lord God, gracious and compassionate, forgiving the inequities of our forefathers. Right? The the, uh, proclamation of the character of God was more important than what Moses actually physically saw with his eyes. An amazing text there. Whenever I think about mankind not being able to see the face of God and live, I think about the grace and the mercy of God. 
I think about how kind God has been to us, that he has sent Jesus so that we could see some aspect of who God is, but even, even then, we don't see every aspect, every essence of who God is through Jesus. Remember when, when Lucy first heard about Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia? She's just, she's terrified of what Mr. and Miss, Mrs. Beaver are saying about this creature, Aslan. And she asks, is he quite safe? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he is good. He's the king, I tell you. God is spirit. His being is, is not made up of any physical matter. He is freed from the restrictions that we have of a, of a physical body. God has no parts. He has no dimensions to him. He is not able to be seen by us because we would die if we took in the full glory and essence of God. But God is also good. And if we are to think of him, we must think of him somehow. And God knew that. So he graciously provides many physical and visible manifestations of who he is. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saw some, something of the presence of God. Jacob wrestled with this this angel of the Lord, right? Who was that guy? He couldn't look, upon, couldn't look upon the guy that he was wrestling. Was that a pre-incarnate Christ, even in that situation? He appeared to the Israelites in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. What did that look like? He shows up to people in visions and in dreams. But most clearly and most definitively, if anything else in Scripture, God is revealed to us in the person of Christ. And most clearly and most definitively, if anything that Christ did in order to know him, he revealed himself through the cross of Christ and through his suffering on the cross. And he took on a real physical body. In John 14, verse 9, Jesus says to Philip, He who has seen me has seen the Father. In Colossians 1, verse 15, Jesus says, it says, uh, the Apostle Paul says, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 1, verse 3 says, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. We read in, in John 4, verse 22, Jesus says to the woman, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Jesus is affirming a great paradox here. On the one hand, God is not restrained to a location, and so believers must worship the Father in spirit. On the other hand, God has specifically revealed himself through the person of Jesus. And the Jewish Messiah was knowable because of the person of Jesus Christ. He is a distinct, he is the object, he is the person of our worship. There is no true knowledge of the invisible God apart from Jesus and who he is. Therefore, there is no true worship apart from worship to Jesus Christ alone. Number three, why in the world does that matter? And I want you to hold your place in John chapter 4 and turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. Look down at verse 18. Why does it matter that God is spirit? I'm going to read just a, a short paragraph in Romans 1. Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's not that the world does not have the truth. You, in order to suppress something, you must have it. So the world has some essence of truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his in, uh, invisible attributes, namely, these are our positives now, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, those are the two things that Paul brings out that are God's invisible attributes. And those things can be clearly perceived. Verse 20. Ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so that every person is without excuse. 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God. This is the great exchange. The truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped unbelievers, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, why does it matter You can turn back to John chapter 4. Why does it matter that God is spirit? It matters because every person is a worshiper. Whether we like it or not, at any given moment, we are all worshiping someone or something. Romans 1 tells us, if you are not worshiping God through Christ, you are worshiping something created rather than the creator. Paul Tripp says it this way. I love it. Human beings were created, and we were created to be worshipers. Worship is not just something we do, it defines who we are. Stolen worship, Paul Tripp says, is at the core of what is wrong with human beings. If it's true that we are always worshiping, then it's also true that there are two types of worship. There is true worship, and there is false worship. True worship is to God through Christ. False worship is to someone or something else. This is where we pick up in John 4, verse 23. The hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. If you are not worshiping in spirit and truth, you are not worshiping the Father. And there's a big clarification. Any of you guys reading the King James Version this morning? Don't raise your hand if you are. You'll be labeled as a King Jameser for the rest of your life, okay? King James Version is good, but I'm sorry. You need to take a pen out and eliminate an indefinite article in John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit. No, he is not. He is spirit, and he is spirit indefinitely. God is spirit, period. He is not one spirit among many. He is spirit indefinitely. If you have the New King James Version, they made that correction, and they were right to do so. Also, I want you to see what verses 23 and 24 don't say. It doesn't say, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. There is one preposition in, and there are two objects of that one preposition. You worship in spirit and truth. If you are worshiping in truth and you are not worshiping in spirit, you are not truly worshiping. If you are worshiping in spirit and not worshiping in truth, you are not truly worshiping. You must be worshiping in spirit and truth. It is a package deal. It is a combo effect. The two come together in one. Notice one small word in verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him worship must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus is not bringing up something desirable according to his perspective. He is speaking of something that is absolutely necessary. You must worship in spirit and truth, if you are to worship. Why does it matter? True worship is to God and in spirit. True worship is to God and in spirit. And that means this. Unless you are born again by the Holy Spirit, you cannot worship God for who he is. You need to be radically born again and have an identity that is caught up in the Spirit of God. A God who is Spirit must be worshipped in Spirit. 
And that brings up a problem that all of us have to face at some point in time in our life, that when we are born into this world, we are spiritually what? Dead in our trespasses and sins. And so our spirit must be made alive by the work of Christ and by the work of the Spirit himself. Ephesians 2, 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We need a spiritual birth to be made alive in the Spirit of God. When that happens, when we have the spiritual birth, there's many things occur. We are baptized into one spirit. We are baptized into the body of Christ. The Spirit of God regenerates us, and he gives us a new life. Our dead spirit now becomes alive to God. This same spirit indwells us so that we can walk with him. He fills us and he empowers us to walk a life that is controlled by the spirit. The spirit of God seals us for the day of redemption. He is our guarantee, the down payment, the inheritance will come, promised by God. All of us have been adopted, all believers have been adopted by God into his family. That adoption is awaiting its full realization in the redemption and the renewal of all things. But without the new birth, according to the Spirit of God, worship in the Spirit is impossible. You can't worship God in spirit if you don't have a spiritually alive sense of who God is and the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. True worship is is in spirit. True worship is by truth as well. The provision of the Spirit is made possible by the one who is truth. And who came on the scene and proclaimed that he is the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus. Jesus is the truth by which we have access to the Spirit and in which our spirit is made alive in the new birth through Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. This is a hard concept in a pluralistic world in which we live. There are all kinds of avenues and ways that you can get to God. You go to Buddhism and you get to God, that's fine. You go your way. You go through your Islamic God and you come to God, that's fine. We all get to the top of the mountain. We all worship the same God at the end of the day, right? Wrong. (laughs) Jesus says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. That means that there is exclusively one way to the Father to worship him through the Spirit, and that is through Jesus, through his Son that he sent to us. Here's what, here's what I love about doing a sermon series on the, on the character of God. Right? And, and I hope we can look back at the sermon series one day and just see that all these peripheral things kind of go away when we focus on what truly matters and God's nature and character. A study of God's character rightly focuses our attention on God instead of on us and instead of on the world. And it eliminates all these peripheral areas where we get, our focus gets derailed. Do you remember the Coke Wars, the Cola Wars from the 70s and 80s? Remember when um, Coca-Cola, bottling soda company, it's, it's out there. If you, if you don't know about Coke, you know, just go to a restaurant somewhere. Remember, Coke had such a great recipe for a soft drink that they, it immediately became a classic. And so it went from be calling, being called Coke to what? Coca-Cola classic. And then the 70s came up. In the mid-70s, these Pepsi guys were like, man, I think I've got a better recipe than these Coke dudes do. And so they issued what was called the Pepsi Challenge. You remember that? And they had all these people come in and do like a taste test, and you put a blindfold over your eyes, and you sipped the Pepsi, and you sipped the Coke. Which one's better? Oh, man, Pepsi Challenge. Pepsi's better every time, right? And so Coke was actually losing some sales because of this. Pepsi was pretty good, pretty good stuff. Actually, Mountain Dew is the drink of the gods after coffee. So just so you guys know, Coffee is my go-to. Mountain Dew is a Pepsi drink. It's a little, focus with me. They had, this, they had this Coke challenge. So Coke, actually, when they started losing business, what did they do? They came out with a new formula for Coke. Remember Coke 2? They had new Coke, and they had Coke 2, and it was so bad, like, it, it didn't <laughs> pass the test. They got rid of both of them, right? And they came back to the Coca-Cola Classic. And they said, we're sticking with what we know works. And, and Coke has been a a staple in the industry ever since. In the church, 
We haven't experienced the cola wars, but we have experienced some wars. We've experienced the worship wars in the American church, right? If you don't like the music here, you can go across the streets of that place, and they're going to do it much different, and you'll like it there. Which one tastes better to you? Here's why I love doing a series on the character of God. Because that kind of stuff kind of goes to the background, and we start focusing on the things that really, truly matter. And listen to me, I'm not saying that the style of music doesn't matter. And I'm not saying it's unimportant to think about the songs that we sing and the lyrics that we have. But I am saying this. If you asked Jesus today what separates true worshipers from false worshipers, his answer is going to be this. True worshipers worship God in spirit and truth. He's not going to tell you to go somewhere else because they've got a different flavor or style of music. Here's the other thing he would say. If you're not worshiping in spirit and truth, you're worshiping a false god. And what you need to do is repent. You need to confess that you've been worshiping a god of your own making and your own desire. And you confess that you are a sinner in desperate need of God's grace. And that now, because of God's Spirit, you have a desire to worship Him truly, in spirit and truth. Something that you could never, ever possibly think of doing, apart from the grace of God in your life. At Tulsa Bible Church, here's the essential for us. The essential is we're going to be a church that worships in spirit and truth. We've got a lot of freedom to do other things, and we're going to celebrate those things. But we want to reach people who don't even know it and don't realize it, but they are worshiping a false God. And we want to bring them the light and the truth of the gospel and enable them to do what every other true believer is doing in this room right now. And that is worshiping our gracious, merciful, holy God in spirit and truth, right? Let's take that message to the city of Tulsa. Let's talk about that aspect of worship more than we talk about any other aspect of worship. And let's be blessed because of it. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, Um, you are a magnificent God. You are spirit. You are uncontainable. You are invisible. You are beyond anything that we can fathom or imagine. And you, a God who is spirit, has revealed yourself through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself so clearly that we might know you in spirit and truth through the work of of the gospel through Jesus on the cross in his death and resurrection. And I pray that anybody listening to this sermon online or anybody here in this room today, if they don't know the true worship of worshiping the Father in spirit and truth, that they would see their need for Christ, that they would repent of their false worship, they would believe in Jesus for everlasting life, and they would now truly worship God because that is what we will all be doing for eternity those of us who know you personally. God, I thank you for, for who you are. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for this community of believers. It's also Bible Church. I thank you that you have um, just given us a passion to be a, a real community that is reaching into the needs of our community. We pray that the work of the gospel would spread not only here right in Tulsa, but around the world through our missionary efforts and through our giving and through what you are doing through your kingdom. God, we ask all these things to you, Father, through the Son and by the Spirit. For you three are the one true God, and there is no God besides you. Amen.